OK, let's see what you guys think. The first question for que uh, group two, why does the essay begin by describing the author's personality? What do you think? OK, so I, I was thinking that actually there are so many books or novels for the readers to read but why he got to you know to pick up the a series of the reacher right the jack the jack reacher series book so i always think that at the opening we can see from the first sentence he say i'm not generally speaking a person who looks on the bright side of things that means maybe he's not so positive not so active when he faces things he always look down right so i was thinking that and the, and the second and the page two he also introduced some information from the jack reacher and he also provided some background information for us i was thinking that maybe he would like to pick the author he would like to pick the the, the books like the series they would send i think that they would share the same similarities you maybe part of Maybe he was saying that uh, the Jack Reacher is part of himself in his characteristics, and uh, he also tried to read the books. I was thinking not only maybe he liked the books or he's interested in these books, but I was thinking that more there's more to do is that he want to use the books to maybe to 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 him to heal himself. Yeah, because he I think that the, at the end of the story is that uh, maybe. He want to be the, the what's that the Jerry Reacher, He's not fear loneliness, right? And he will be just like him, right? So uh, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so group two gave us a two part answer. Um, the first part of group two's answer is that maybe the author is explaining why she is attracted to reading this kind of book. So as group two mentions, the author's description of herself is not a not an optimistic person, doesn't always try to see the bright side of things. And when we think about Jack Reacher, this character, uh, we also can't say that he's optimistic. We can't say he's pessimistic either, but he's not optimistic. So this kind of a shared personality between the author of this essay and Jack Reacher, the main character of the novels, seems to be one way for the essay to introduce us to the character through the author. We, when we start reading the essay, the author is the first person we meet. So through the author, we might uh, already be familiar or more familiar with the kind of person that Jack Reacher is. I think that makes sense. The other reason group two gave us is that by the time we reach the end of the essay, we realize that this is not an essay about Jack Reacher, right? The title of the essay is My Year with Jack Reacher. So there are two people in the title, Jack Reacher and the author. And it by the end of the essay, it turns out that this essay is about that relationship. The group two says that the author seems to be trying to heal herself by reading these novels. Uh, and so because the focus is also on the author, it makes sense to begin by introducing the author as a person, not just as a guide or a writer. So not just someone putting words on the page, but a living, breathing person that we should think about when we're reading the essay. And that helps to prepare us for the main topic, which is not just the book, but also the relationship between the author and the book. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, other groups, would you like to add your ideas to this question? OK, let's move on. Question two for group three is asking whether this sentence could be talking about more than one thing.
You know, um, our department actually does have wireless microphones, um, but they're broken. So I have to run around. Sorry about that. Um, so group three gave us two answers. Um, and in this part of the essay, uh, this is page three, second paragraph, four lines from the bottom. So the sentence begins, short sentences. Short sentences with minimal punctuation. Eventually you get used to it. It's amazing what you can get used to given enough time. So this is the first thing that this sentence is referring to, right? Short sentences. Uh, but group three thinks that it could be referring to some other things also. Uh, it could be referring to the fact that the author is in quarantine alone. Uh, if we go back to page one, first paragraph, line one, two, three, four, five, six. In the middle, she says, as it became clear, I would have to spend some significant time staying in my apartment. As it became clear means that she discovered this fact. She did not plan to do this. It happened to her. So maybe this is also something that she has to try to get used to over time. Uh, and this is a very important change for her life. By the end of the essay on page seven, uh, it says the, the middle paragraph, two lines from the bottom in the middle. His loneliness does not kill him. He barely notices it at all. I would like to stop noticing mine so much. So quarantine is really having a negative effect on her. She feels very lonely by herself. And in the essay, it also talks about how she feels depressed, can't really do things in her life normally. So this is really a big change that um, she also has to try to get used to. By the end of the essay, has she gotten used to quarantine? Not yet. So when she says it's amazing what you can get used to given enough time, it's not describing her loneliness. It's a kind of hope. She hopes that with a little more time, she can get used to this. And then group three also gave us uh, one other answer. Something else that she might still trying to be get, uh, getting used to, and that is her non-existent relationship with her father. Um, starting on page Five, thank you. Um, she introduces the topic of fathers in general. Uh, the connection is that Jack Reacher often says a lot of bullshit, and she has observed that many fathers also seem to have a lot of this kind of bullshit. Um, and slowly we understand that her own father, oh, she thinks about fathers in general, because she doesn't really have her own father that uh, she can think about. We see this on page five, the middle big paragraph, one, two, three, four, five lines from the bottom. So here she's talking about the kind of bullshit that um, Jack Reacher and the author Malcolm Gladwell like to say. And here she says, uh, Reacher loves this kind of thing. Would my dad? I don't know. I can't remember him ever reading a book when I was growing up, but perhaps that's changed now. There's so much I don't know about him, but I've always assumed I would have plenty of time to find out. I don't assume that anymore. 
So from these few lines, we can tell that she is no longer close with her father. She basically doesn't really talk to him. And that the pandemic being in quarantine has made her rethink her situation with her father. She used to assume that one day uh, she would repair her relationship with her father. But now that the world has changed so much so fast, she doesn't think that it will always be possible in the future. So she is therefore forced to face the fact that her life right now is missing her father and that maybe her life might end without regaining him. In this, uh, in that case, this kind of uh, emotional change, this kind of emotional shift is actually the exact opposite of this sentence, right? It's amazing what you can get used to given enough time. In this case, this sentence would be describing her past attitude toward her father. Uh, something like, how come I never felt it was important to try to repair my relationship with my father? Maybe it's because so much time had passed that I had gotten used to it. But now that the pandemic is here, I have to re-examine that habit, that old relationship. You know, that's one of the reasons I chose this essay is because uh, the author is able to talk about so many different things in only seven short pages. Uh, thank you, group three. Other groups, do you want to add ideas about this question? Um, I'm not asking to be polite. If a group gives an answer that doesn't make sense, I'm not going to correct it. I'm going to see if you guys have other ideas. OK, let's move on. Question three, group four. How would you describe the essay's style? Uh, so group four says that the style of the essay is kind of like a diary. It's uh, personal. The development uh, group four says it's freestyle, but it's it's there's a plan, so we can't really say it's freestyle. It's more associative instead of logical. So if you write an argument essay, your first point has to follow your second point has to follow your third point. But in this essay, the logic is uh, talking about this makes her think about that, and talking about that makes her think about something else. So there's a logic, but it goes in a different direction. Uh, associative thinking in Chinese, we call that uh, right? It moves sideways. Uh, and another reason why group four calls it a kind of diary style is because of the sentence structure and grammar. It's not always perfect, right? They mentioned that some sentences are not complete sentences. We can also notice that sometimes uh, there's no punctuation where there should be punctuation, like they're missing commas, um, things like that. 
And um, this might be entering onto question four, but there's also the use of uh, slang and cursing, right? Uh, we call this dirty language, zhanghua. Um, and that also makes it seem like it's directly from the author's mind to the paper. Uh, of course, it's not that direct, right? There, it, it, there is a plan, there is a structure. Maybe it started out as a kind of direct writing, but she later edited the essay to, to give it a central idea. Um, as for the second part of this question, why does the essay use this style? Group four uh, echoes group two in that the main topic of this idea is of this essay is the author's relation with the novels. Uh, at first, she kind of looked down on this kind of writing, right? She preferred Victorian novels, if you remember from British literature, these are 19th century English novels or Russian novels, those kinds of things. But when she started, she got hooked. And by the end of this essay, we can feel that she has been comforted by this kind of novel. And that kind of personal relationship uh, is best expressed using a personal style, right? If the topic of the essay is her own mental and emotional change, then it makes sense for the style to kind of be like a diary. Because a diary is usually the most direct record of a person's thinking and feeling. All right, good. Um, other groups, do you want to add ideas about this question? OK, let's move on. Question four, uh, group five, your question is asking about the essay's tone, how the author communicates with the reader. Did you guys notice some different kinds of tone? OK, hang on. If you're watching the video from home, I'm currently struggling with the microphone cord. OK. So one thing that group five noticed is that the author sometimes uses humor. Uh, not by telling jokes, but sometimes her way of writing or we could say way of speaking is a bit sarcastic or maybe a bit ironic, sometimes even a bit absurd. Um, the best example is the last line of the essay. She's just finished talking about uh, how reading about Jack Reacher, who doesn't care about his loneliness, she hopes this could help her get used to her loneliness. And then the last two lines. Or maybe I just want to go around punching people in the face. She's obviously joking. Um, and then the last line, at the very least, I wish there were more books left for me to read. That's also a shift in tone from joking back to uh, reality, we could say. Um, so why does the author sometimes use humor? Group five says maybe it's because if she talked about this subject completely seriously, it might be too emotionally heavy. Because think about what she's talking about. Global pandemic, being depressed all day every day, 
can't take a shower, can't do the dishes. Being alone in the house 24-7. Uh, realizing that she doesn't have a father in her life. Like all of these ideas are really, really sad. Um, and so if she were really serious and straightforward about these topics, the reader might not understand that this is only half of the essay. The other half of the essay is the novels, the Jack Reacher stories. So in short, if there was less humor, the essay might be imbalanced. We would focus too much on one side and less on the other. Um, and so like the example I was just reading uh, at the very end of the essay is exactly doing this. Just before the last paragraph, she's talking about how lonely she is. Uh, but because it, she doesn't want it to feel so heavy, um, she adds a joke at the end before concluding the essay. Another uh, similar place of humor is on page three. Uh, first paragraph, line five. But uh, let's start with line four. So she started reading uh, these novels. I gobbled them up, taking a Reacher book everywhere I went. I read them in bed, on the couch, back in bed. That's also a joke. Um, when she says, I took the book everywhere I went, usually we would expect her to say things like, to the park, to the shower, to shopping. But of course, she's in lockdown. So everywhere she went is basically the bed, the couch, the bed. It's not too many places. So by describing her situation in a funny way, um, she can make us focus more on the absurdity of the situation, rather than how scary it is or how depressing it is, that she would only go from her bed to the couch and then back to her bed. Does that make sense? So that's one way that, uh, that's one reason why she changes tone from one place to another. There's also a place, some places where um, her tone shifts to more serious, to more informative, kind of like the essays that you guys practice in essay class. Um, from page four to page five, when she's talking about the different kinds of bullshit uh, that dads and Jack Reacher like to say, that's an example of a more serious tone. And that place uses a serious tone because it is new information. And so she wants us to take it seriously. She doesn't want us to treat it as a joke. OK, thank you, group five. Do other groups want to add ideas to this question? OK, let's take a short break.
Let's continue. Group one. Your question. Do you think the author's experience is worth writing about? If yes, why? If no, why not? What do you guys think? Uh, so group one says, uh, yes, this is something worth writing about because uh, group one focuses on something that the author writes on page six. Is it on page six? Sorry, no, on page seven. Uh, page seven, the second paragraph, first line. The author writes, lots of people have used fiction lately as a way to confront and master their fears. And so for group one, this is something that the author is also doing. Um, by reading these Jack Reacher novels, she is confronting her fears about her life. Uh, and she's trying to master those fears. She's trying. Uh, as we talked about for question four, she's not completely successful yet, but she's trying. And so for group one, this is the value of this essay uh, to show that even reading some like trashy novels like these Jack Reacher novels also have something to teach us. Uh, as they said, it's a simple story with a not so simple lesson. Uh, and I would add a little bit to that answer, which is this essay doesn't just tell us that we can learn from fiction. It shows us one person's journey uh, of learning from fiction or getting something valuable from fiction, even if it's not knowledge or some kind of skill. I mean, she talks about knowledge and skill, right? Knowledge, which turns out to be bullshit. Skill in fighting, which she's probably not going to use. So if she does learn something from these novels, it's probably not knowledge or skill. It's probably something like uh, self understanding. Understanding her life situation and um, what she has to do in order to continue uh, living her life in a satisfactory way or an acceptable way to herself. Something like that. If it were easy to put into words, uh, we wouldn't need to read the essay, right? I could just tell you. Um, I have a follow up question for group one. So you guys gave a pretty good answer about why this topic is worth writing about. Some people might disagree. 
Why do you think some people might say it's not worth writing about? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. So group one's answer is that um, whether or not it's worth writing about or worth reading depends on the life situation of the reader. Um, from the beginning, we've been talking about the personal perspective. Uh, and so perhaps the kind of reader who would find this essay valuable is maybe the person who feels a lot of similar emotions. Um, this essay was published in March of 2021. Uh, at that time, there were still many people in lockdown in the United States. Uh, and so we can assume that many people felt similar emotions, loneliness, scared, worried that they may not have the chance to repair old relationships. Uh, but group one says that not every person would be in the same situation. We in Taiwan today reading this essay are in a very different situation. Lockdowns have ended. Uh, we mostly go about our daily lives like normal, just uh, a little bit more anxiety, but generally uh, more normal than the author at that time. So perhaps when we read this essay, it, it does not connect so immediately or so directly. And for someone who was in lockdown with their favorite friends and family together in one bubble, uh, or someone who has had a happy childhood and is still in close contact with their parents, uh, these emotions might be unfamiliar. So when I ask a question, I always try to make sure that both answers can make sense. And we can see how uh, even though this essay is something that I think is a pretty good essay and I chose it for this class, um, it's perfectly OK to think something else, to think that this essay doesn't apply to me. I don't feel anything. Why are we reading this? But these kinds of thoughts are also worth talking about because they are also one kind of reaction to literature. There's a lot of so-called great literature that's really boring, um, and yet it is still great because we can talk about why people used to think it's great, but now many people think it's boring. What has changed in society and in history so that we no longer look at a classic piece of literature in the same way? That's part of uh, one reason why it's classic, because it can support that kind of discussion. By talking about these questions, we can still reach some meaningful ideas, even if those ideas are not conclusions. OK, do other groups want to add to this question? Do you guys have other thoughts about this essay? Uh, 
OK, let me briefly introduce the next essay uh, and then we'll go back to the beginning and we'll do a close reading. Jing Du, Xi Du. Next week, we're going to be reading an essay by Gretchen Felker Martin called I Don't Want to Grow Up and Neither Can You. Uh, Felker Martin is a cultural critic. She talks about films and books, things like that. Um, one of the uh, there are two important things to keep in mind uh, when we read her work. One is that she loves horror and not just the scary stuff, but also the disgusting stuff. The worse the more the worse it is, the more terrible it is, the more disgusting it is, the more she likes to talk about it. The other thing to remember is that she's actually a transgender woman. When she was born, she was assigned male at birth, which means when she was born, the doctors took a look at her and said, this is a boy. But more and more, we've come to realize that a person's physical sex may not always be the same as their uh, gender identity. Um, in Chinese gender identity, we call this xing bie ren tong. Uh, and there's really no other way to translate this because gender identity is not just do you like doing guy things or girl things? Do you uh, feel more similar to guys or similar to girls? It's all of that and a little bit more. The best way I've heard uh, this described is do I feel at home in my body? in the way that I fit in the world? Do I think that I should be a different gender or maybe something in between two genders? Um, and so currently in the United States, there's a very fierce debate about um, whether being transgender is a quote unquote natural thing. Uh, and the most scientific answer is Yes, it's natural because it happens naturally. Um, but there's a lot of uh, confusion and even fear about, uh, like, you know, if people can just say that they're a different gender, society would collapse, uh, which is obviously not true. But it does take uh, some time to get used to, right? It takes some time to get used to the idea that. Uh, someone might look like a man, but actually be inside as a person, a woman, uh, and would go through the world as a woman and expect others to treat her as a woman. This is this. Uh, I don't want to say a unique backstory, but this particular backstory of the author's life gives her um, a very unusual perspective on life, but also on issues related to sex and gender and uh, relations between the sexes. So we, we should keep that in mind as we read this essay, because this essay is basically saying things like works of art, right? Movies, books, music that one person thinks is not just bad, but like evil, uh, could be har harmful, may in fact be incredibly helpful and necessary for a different kind of person. Um, and if we think about this idea, the best way to argue for this idea is to choose some works of art that most people would think is evil and harmful and hurtful. And to try to get the reader to see why other people might think the exact opposite. So some of the ideas in this essay will be very uncomfortable. You might find it uh, absurd, gross, disgusting, uh, unreasonable. You might think she's joking, but I assure you she's being very serious. Uh, so I want to, you to, when you read it, try to 
put aside your own feelings about these issues and try to understand what she's trying to tell the reader. And we can talk about it next week. OK. OK, and um, you all should have bought a copy of the textbook now. We will be reading the novel in the second half of the semester. Uh, it will be the topic of your final exam. So don't lose the textbook. OK, let's go back to my year with Jack Reacher, page one. And um, I will do the traditional English teacher thing. The first interesting thing I want to point out to you is on the left side of the page. Uh, the description of the picture. We call this a caption. You can see the subtitles on the screen, a caption. Um, it usually tells us where the picture comes from. So here it's uh, the photo photographer's name is Toru Yamanaka. AFP is the French press. Um, so this is where the picture was created. But the it's probably the editor. The editor got this picture from a company called Getty Images. So there are companies out there who buy up lots and lots of pictures. And so when you need to use one of those pictures, you have to buy it from the company. And Getty Images is one of those companies. So usually a caption will have the source of the image and then it will describe the image. And this is the description. This is Tom Cruise pretending to be Jack Reacher, even though he's way too small to be Jack Reacher. Uh, usually the description should be objective and short. But in this case, the description is very subjective. It has an opinion about this picture. So immediately, even before we begin to read the essay, we already have a sense of the style and the tone of this essay. Very subjective, personal, and in many places, not very serious, right? More humorous, more ironic. Uh, especially the word pretending. Tom Cruise is not pretending to be Jack Reacher. He's acting as the character Jack Reacher. Calling it pretending is kind of like insulting him as an actor. And that's part of the joke. Because he's too short, we can't believe in him as Jack Reacher. So we kind of laugh at him like he's only pretending. OK, line one. I am not generally speaking a person who looks on the bright side of things. The words generally speaking are also a joke. Um, if actually, if you ever have the chance to go on exchange to the United States, it might surprise you how much of daily uh, everyday English is just joking. I think Americans joke more than they're serious. Um, usually it's very subtle, right? It's not very obvious. It, the choice of words, the tone of voice, uh, the ways that sentences are put in order can all reveal some kind of humor. Here, generally speaking, is a joke because this sentence is a very general sentence. I am not an optimistic person is a very general description of a person. So generally speaking, these two words are redundant. You don't need those two words. So by adding those two words back in, the author is making fun of herself. And why is she making fun of herself? Because uh, like when we teach you composition, right? We say begin your introduction with a general idea. Um, and they teach the same thing in the US high school as well. And so everybody who goes through high school learns this rule, begin with a general statement. And it then becomes an example of so-called 
school uh, schoolboy writing, right? Student writing. In other words, not good writing. So when the author begins this essay with a general statement, with a statement that is not considered good writing, she acknowledges that this is not good writing by pointing out why it's not good. So she's laughing at herself. But by some magic of writing, if you point out that you know you're not doing a good job, that means that you're actually doing a good job. Um, it's like this. When we think about, is this good? Is this piece of art good? Is this piece of writing good? We're talking about two things. The writing itself, judged according to some standard that maybe we can agree on. And the intention of the artist. What is the artist trying to do? Or the writer, what is the writer trying to do? So a bad work of art would be something that looks bad, and the artist doesn't know that it looks bad. That's the worst kind. The best kind is, of course, something that looks awesome, uh, and the artist knows that it looks awesome. But in between, you have the kind of art that looks bad, and the author knows that it looks bad. The fact that it looks bad is part of the design of the art. Uh, one example is so-called pop art, Popu Ishu, Andy Warhol. If you guys remember from world history class in high school. Um, so by pointing out that she knows that this is not good writing, it makes the writing better. It's part of her design. OK, next sentence. I view cheerfulness in the face of calamity with a lot of suspicion, if not outright contempt, and have done since childhood. Cheerfulness in the face of calamity. Uh, this sentence is very, it feels very smooth. This phrase feels very smooth because it follows a strict meter. Uh, in the face of calam uh, cheerfulness in the face of calamity. It's two unstressed syllables followed by one stressed syllable. Um, usually when English pays attention to this kind of pattern, and there's some kind of regularity, it feels more smooth. It feels more natural. So her choice of the word calamity does this job. She could have chosen another word, right? Disaster or bad things. But calamity fits the meter very well. And there's also like a, an echo of the two L sounds cheerful and calamity. So that's why this word is better than the word catastrophe. Cheerfulness in the face of catastrophe would have one L and one T. It doesn't feel like it fits together. Um, OK, and then in line three, it says, if not outright contempt. In English, if not means even. So when she says suspicion, if not outright contempt, she means suspicion, even outright contempt. To view something with suspicion means you don't really trust it. You don't think it's quite right. Uh, and then near the end of this line, and have done since childhood. This sentence tells us that she's Canadian. American English would say, have done so, since childhood. Uh, but more British forms of English uh, like to skip words here and there. 
Uh, this is also a question of stress, Qing Zhongying. Have done so, the stress is on the word done. But have done, the stress is on the word have. American English would never stress the word have if, if it can avoid it. Uh, because the word have is not the main verb. It's an auxiliary verb, as a zhu dong si. And uh, American English does not like to emphasize auxiliary words like has or is. So the fact that she chose to emphasize the word have here tells us that her first English is not American English. But it sounds very similar to American English in many different places. So my guess is that she's Canadian. Canadian. So she talks about how she's not an optimist, and then she gives an example. I remember watching Pollyanna with my Nana and telling her that I wouldn't like to be friends with a girl like that. Uh, Pollyanna, this story is most famous for the fact that its main character, Pollyanna, is a girl who is always optimistic. No matter what kind of stuff happens to her, she always tries to be cheerful and hopeful and happy. Uh, and in fact, this story is so infamous for that, that in English we now have a word called Pollyanna-ish, which means like Pollyanna, too optimistic, too happy, unreasonably optimistic. Uh, and this sentence also foreshadows the fact that maybe her family situation is not very happy because she's watching Pollyanna with her grandmother, not her mother. OK, continuing. Nevertheless, around this time last year, uh, OK, so her quarantine was around March 2020. So it's the first quarantine. Um, Americans and most North Americans went into the first lockdown after like March 21st of 2020. So around this time last year, as it became clear, I would have to spend some significant time staying in my apartment. Uh, so we talked about this. This took her by surprise. It was not her plan. I told myself there could be an upside. I could finally get around to reading all the books I had been putting off for one reason or another. Some neglected American classics, the Victorian door stoppers I skipped over in school in favor of different Victorian door stoppers the less famous Russians. So we have another joke. Uh, this kind of joke follows the pattern of a list of three things, and the further down the list you go, the more specific and absurd the thing is. So it's normal, a bit ridiculous, very ridiculous. So the normal example is American classics. OK, yeah, we all have classic novels that People keep telling us to read and we never read, right? In Chinese, maybe it's things like Hong Sangwo Yan Yi, things like that. Xi Yo Ji, I don't know. The second thing, a Victorian doorstopper. As I mentioned, Victorian is the 19th century in the UK. A doorstopper in English, uh, sorry, uh, a doorstopper in Chinese is Men Dang. So calling a novel a doorstopper is saying that this novel is so thick that if you put it in front of a door, it can hold the door open. So a doorstopper is a really thick book. And it's true, Victorian novels were incredibly thick and long, and this is because they were published chapter by chapter in the newspaper. So the longer the story went, the more money the author made. So you end up with really, really long Victorian novels. 
Now, the slightly ridiculous part of this example is she skipped these really long novels in order to read other really long novels. Right, she skipped Victorian doorstoppers in favor of different Victorian doorstoppers. And this kind of changes our expectation of what's going on. At first we think, oh, she didn't read American classics because she thought they were boring. But then by the second example, we realize she doesn't think it's boring. She just wanted to read other classic books instead of these classic books. And then the third example, the less famous Russians. We all know the famous Russians, right? Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, uh, in Chinese, and a few others. But of course, Russia is its own country. It has its own literary history. There are so many Russian authors that we usually don't know about. But this author wanted, was planning to read those less famous Russian authors. Uh, and so that's the joke. We, over the course of this sentence, our understanding of her as a reader has changed. We begin this sentence by thinking that she's someone who doesn't like to read classic novels. We end the sentence by realizing that she doesn't like to read classic novels because she thinks they're too easy and too boring and she wants to read something harder. Uh, so by playing with the reader's expectations, it's a kind of joke. It also tells us something about her as a reader. Uh, first, she does read, and secondly, uh, she likes to read uh, hard stuff. Precisely the opposite of the Jack Reacher novels. And so that opposite, the idea of something completely opposite, is the topic of the next paragraph. I have not read any of those. What I have read is 24 books about an enormous drifter with comically large hands who is good at dispatching people. So a drifter is someone who doesn't have a home and wanders from place to place. Uh, to uh, the closest word in Chinese is driftwood, piao liu mu. To drift is piao liu. And he's enormous, right? She will later tell us that Jack Reacher is both tall and heavy. And he has large hands, comically large hands, so large that when you see them, you want to laugh. Unbelievably, ridiculously, absurdly, funnily large hands. And he's good at dispatching people. Uh, usually dispatch means you send someone somewhere. But here dispatch means you kill them or you get rid of them. Uh, I think the full phrase is you dispatch them to hell. And so there's this is the the bigger part of the joke. She likes to read classic hard things, but she ended up ended up reading 24 of these trash books. Continuing. Lee Child's Jack Reacher series follows Reacher, just Reacher, no middle name and barely a first one. Even his mother forewent using it. As he travels across America by train or bus or hitching a ride. So this third paragraph is when we finally leave the author's personal experience and she starts telling us the main idea of these novels. This paragraph is essential to any piece of criticism. When you write a piece of criticism or like a review, shuping, you always have to describe what you are reviewing. Um, because people read reviews for two reasons. One is I just finished this book or this movie and I want to see what people think about it. So I'm going to read a film review. 
The other reason is I've heard of this book or movie and I don't know if I want to see it or watch it. So let's see what other people think first. This is to say that some people who read reviews don't know what you're talking about, so you have to describe it for them. This is what uh, this paragraph does. It describes the Jack Reacher books so that we know what she's talking about. Uh, and the first um, unusual detail about the main character is that even his mother didn't use his full name. Even his mother call, just calls him Reacher. Uh, page two, line one, near the end, we have the word forwent. This is the past tense of forego, and forego means to give up. Uh, to to uh, not use, not have, give away, to give up. It's also a joke, this word, because we usually don't see the past tense of forego. Uh, this word is very rare, and yet it's one of those words that's easy to guess what it means because we know that uh, for the verb go, it's go, went, gone. So it makes sense that for the word forego, it should be forego, forwent, foregone. So even though we usually don't see this word, we can easily guess its meaning. Uh, and that's part of the joke. It's when you first see the word, it looks unfamiliar, but you very quickly understand what it is. Uh, so we follow this guy as he travels across America, train, bus, or hitching a ride. To hitch a ride is to hitchhike, da bian uh, And you'll notice that he doesn't drive himself. He always travels by somebody else taking him somewhere. Uh, I want to add one thing. So it says that everyone calls him Reacher his last name. In the old days, and by the old days, I mean before 1960 or maybe 1970, it was considered rude to call someone by their first name. You would always call people Mr. Smith or just Smith. You would never call someone John uh, unless you were very close with John a good friend, known him for many years. So even co-workers would call each other by their last name. Um, and this, of course, has changed. Now we like to pretend that everybody is very close to each other. Um, but this is why when you read a novel in English, usually the character's name will be the last name. If you think about Harry Potter, the only three characters well, not only, but like mainly the three characters where we see the first name are the three main characters, right? Harry, Hermione, Ron. But most of the other characters, we usually see their last name. Malfoy, Snape, uh, and like some of the uh, other students. Cheng. And that tells us the distance between characters. We see the first names of the three main characters because they're very close. And the further away from Harry, the less likely we see their first name. So even though this is an older kind of logic, uh, it still applies when we read, um, when we read fiction or nonfiction. When we read a, like a news report, the first time you meet uh, like an expert, it will introduce the expert, right? This person and they are an expert on something, something. But later, if the author has to refer to the same person, the author will use the expert's last name only. Um, you can pay attention to this when you read nonfiction in the future. You always have to remember somebody's last name, but only rarely do you have to remember their first name. So the fact that even Reacher's mother only calls him Reacher tells us that they were not close. 
OK, let's continue. We're at the end of line two. Fate or chance always end up landing him somewhere someone needs killing. This is also a joke. Usually we don't say that somebody needs to be killed. Right, everybody has a right to life. We shouldn't kill people. So when it says that somebody needs killing, uh, it's kind of a joke about how this is not realistic. It's more like a fantasy. It's pure fiction. Um, and only in a non-realistic fantasy fictional world would some people objectively and without any doubt whatsoever deserve to be killed. Um, and so by very casually describing uh, some characters like this, the author is using a, a joking tone to let us know that this world of the novel is very unrealistic and that we shouldn't think of the world of the novel as realistic. Let's continue. He's an ex army MP who is raised on military bases across the world by his French mother and US Marine father. MP can mean two things. When we talk about the military, it means member, uh, sorry, it means military police. Uh, if we talk about politics, it means member of parliament, but only in countries where uh, they have a parliament. Right, you in the United States, they have a Congress, so you wouldn't call uh, the people in Congress MPs. So Jack Reacher used to be an army MP. MPs are in charge of making sure that military people follow the law, right? Uh, that's why they're called military police. And in the military, everybody hates military police because they're the guys who catch you if you break the rules. Um, but this also tells us his relationship, uh, his, his personality and his relationship to other soldiers. Even in the army, Jack Reacher is isolated. He's in a different group from all of his uh, fellow soldiers. And in fact, he's so different, so isolated, that he can't even fit in with the other MPs. So he's an ex-MP. He is no longer an MP. So you have the main group of soldiers, then you have the group outside the soldiers, and Jack Reacher is outside of the outside group. He's totally alone. And it, said, it gives us the detail about his background. He's raised on military bases across the world. If you know anything about people who grow up in this kind of background, it's usually also that um, they don't have many close friends because they keep moving from place to place. And every place they go, it's not a part of that country. It's only a part of that military base. So everything about Reacher's background tells us he is a very isolated person. Even in his own family, a French mother and a US Marine father, two parents from two different backgrounds. Uh, and if the two parents don't agree on the kind of culture and education to give their child, then you basically end up growing up in two different families. Whenever uh, Reacher talks with his mother. It's in a French logic and a French style. When he talks with his father, it's an American logic, American style. So even in his own family, there's no sense of home. Reacher is designed to be the most isolated man. Um, let's stop here. You guys have questions about this essay? OK, so uh, please read the next essay before coming to class next week. The week after that, 
is a very long essay, 20 something pages. Um, if you want to start reading it before next week, you're very welcome to begin early. That essay is asking the question, when is it OK to not read a classic piece of literature? When is it OK to totally ignore a classic author? OK, that's it. See you next week.